this is why I told you we should have left the house at least four hours before you actually did. I let out an exasperated sigh and shot a glance into the passenger seat where a pair of blue eyes glowered back at me. It's late and we're both tired. Let's not start off our first ever vacation to Vegas by turning into a bitter old couple when we've only been married for what, two days in a change? For a moment, the blue eyes continued to try and pierce my skin. And then they closed as my wife let out a sigh of her own, nodding. You're right. I'm sorry. Just having to look at nothing but desert for the last five or six hours kind of got to me. She shot me a look that conveyed equal parts love and slight irritation. And if someone didn't insist on holding on to an almost 30-year-old BMW and listen to me on getting a new one with a navigation system, we wouldn't have gotten turned around on those side roads. I let out a soft laugh. Paula Clements, you knew damn well when you married me that I'm not the kind of man who sells something that works perfectly well just to have something new and flashy and end up with seven years of debt jammed on my shoulders. She snorted. Yes, I most certainly did, honey. She reached across the center console and stroked a finger across my cheek. Just count yourself lucky I find you cute with a good sense of humor. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put up with it for the last five years, let alone married you. She said teasingly. I laughed loudly. I love you too, I replied. Giving a small, sly smile to show she was satisfied with our little quip. She leaned forward and pulled a rather battered roadmap from the glove compartment. Paula and I had met each other almost six years ago to the day. And to sum it up in 30 words or less, even though she seemed completely out of my league, we made a perfect match. We dated for four and a half years before I finally popped a question to her, which she burst into tears, screaming yes when I dropped one knee while at a friend's barbecue and held out the engagement ring I secretly bought. A half a year of planning later, and the two of us officially became husband and wife. As part of our honeymoon, I decided for us to spend it in a place we'd both wanted desperately to visit, but never had a chance. Las Vegas. Neither one of us really did any research on the city, deciding to wing it by driving the day after our wedding from our home in Washington to Nevada. The only thing we did look up was a hotel booking, getting a room at a place called The Venetian. But unfortunately, we'd left too late, and instead of arriving in the city at dusk, we were arriving in the middle of the night. According to the orange glow of my 7 series' clock, it was approaching 3 a.m. Paula clicked on the dome light and studied the map in her lap, tracing the route with one finger while slowly winding her platinum blonde hair around the finger of her other hand. It looks like we'll be coming into the city from the southwest, so just keep on going straight on Las Vegas Boulevard and it'll take us right in. She declared before putting the map away again. We could already see the bright white glow of the city's lights ahead of us. In a few minutes later, we passed by the world-famous Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign. As it disappeared behind us, I began grinning like an idiot, seeing out of the corner of my eye that Paula was smiling as well. See? Told you it was a good idea to come in on Las Vegas Boulevard instead of the highway, I said, to which she gave my shoulder a playful shove. Yes, you're right again. Now, let's just find our hotel so we can check in and get some sleep. Amen to that sentiment, babe, I thought. A minute later though, a mixture of confusion and irritation washed over me like a wave. I let out a sigh. What's wrong, darling? My wife asked me as we came to a stop at a red light. I gestured ahead of us. Honestly, sweetheart, I have no freaking idea where we're going. We might have made a mistake by not researching exactly what all the hotels were named and where they are on the strip, because I'm completely freaking lost. And to make matters worse, I'm getting more tired by the minute. As if my words had triggered it. I let out a massive yawn. I put my head in my hands as I waited for the light to turn green. I don't know what to do, I admitted. I shot a look at Paula, who was gently biting her lip, a trademark sign she was thinking. Finally she spoke. Look, it's extremely late right now. Why don't we just randomly pick a hotel to stay in for the night, and tomorrow we'll find the Venetian and check in there. What can it hurt, right? I turned her words over in my head for a moment. She had a point. I'd booked our stay for two weeks with a 48 hour grace period to check in. Staying somewhere else for one night would be okay. All right, sounds like a plan, I said, gesturing ahead of us. So, since you were the one to come up with a plan, Mrs. Clemens, how about you pick our stay for the night? 
a corner of her mouth turned up in an amused smirk. Why, certainly, Mr. Clements. She retorted as the light turned green and I continued on. Surprisingly, I didn't see many other cars on the road, even though I knew most of the city was open 24-7. Well, can't expect everyone to be up all the time. My thoughts were broken through by Paula's voice. What about that one? She asked, pointing at a rather unique and honestly neat sign appearing ahead on our left. The sign looks really neat and old school, she added, almost as if reading my thoughts. I leaned down slightly to get a better view of it. It was an hotel and casino I'd heard of before. But I shrugged my shoulders. Why not? I said. It looks about as good as anything else. Turning into the cutoff, I looked left and right, then crossed the street and pulled into the driveway which led to the hotel's entrance. Driving in under the orange lights of the awning, I brought the car to a stop. Through the glass, I saw what looked like a valet and a bellhop jump to attention from their posts and hurry over to us. I let out a soft laugh. It looks like they didn't expect anyone else coming in tonight, I thought. That's when I felt a small wave of puzzlement wash over me. Both men, who appeared to be in their early mid-twenties, were still walking towards us, but they were looking at my car with an odd expression on their face, one which I can still recall perfectly all these months later. I can see them quietly muttering to each other as they approached us, pointing and shrugging. What the heck about my car has them so... so... I don't know... off? It's nothing more than a 7 Series BMW from 1995. I pushed the thought away. These people were probably used to much newer and more expensive luxury cars. Seeing one as old as mine was probably a surprise to them. Well, no time like the present. I said as I shut off the car and pulled the key from the ignition, turning to look at Paula. She nodded and we both pulled on our respective door handles, pushing them open and stepping out into the late night. The rather chilly air caught me off guard and I flipped up the collar of my jacket to protect my neck. Hello sir and welcome, came a young man's voice and I turned to see the valley striding around the back of the car, his prior odd expression gone and replaced by the traditional professional smile. I returned it with a smile of my own. Thank you very much. Apologies if you didn't expect anyone coming in so late. He waved away my apology. It's quite alright, sir. We used to people arriving at all hours of the day and night. He gestured to the car's trunk. Can the bell help assist you with you and your wife's backs? I nodded, aiming the key at the trunk and hitting the trunk release button. Obediently, and with a small squeak of protest from the aging hinges, the lid rose up presenting our backs to the bellhop. For a moment, the same odd and almost surprised expression crossed his face as he stared at the open trunk. And then, same as the valet, it was replaced with a professional smile. He reached in and pulled the two suitcases out, placing them on his cart and closing the trunk before beginning to walk towards the entrance. I shot a look over the roof of the car at the other side to see if Paul had caught it as well. The expression on her face told me she did and she gave me a puzzled look back. I shrugged my shoulders at her, then turned to the valet, who stood by patiently. I shook my head, snoring softly. Sorry, here, I said, feeling a little sheepish and handing him the keys. He nodded and handed me a valley stop to retrieve my car before climbing behind the wheel. For a few moments, he simply sat in the driver's seat. I was just about to knock on the window and ask if everything was alright, before I heard the engine start and the car pulled away from us. Stepping next to my wife, I looked at her and shook my head slowly as our eyes met. Okay, what the hell was that all about? I asked quietly. She shook her head as well. I honestly don't know, she said. Maybe it's just how the place is at night. Anyways, it's late. Let's just check in and get up to our room. We can figure out the weirdness tomorrow. Nodding in agreement, I let her lead the way. We just pushed open the doors and stepped inside when a thought flashed into my mind. Shit! I hissed, stopping dead in my tracks. Paula turned to me, a look of concern on her face. What? What is it? She asked, reaching out and putting a hand on my shoulder. I left my damn phone charger plugged into the cigarette lighter, I said. She let out a small laugh at my words. That's all? Just go get it tomorrow. I shook my head pulling out my smartphone and clicking a button to bring the screen up. Can't, 
I've only got 10% of juice left in the battery. For a moment, I debated what to do. Look, go on ahead of me to the lobby and start to check in. I said, gesturing towards the end of the hall where I could see the bellhop waiting with our backs. I'm gonna quickly double back and grab it out of the car. I won't be long. She shot me a slightly exasperated look, but nodded and turned away. Fine, just don't take too long, okay? She said over her shoulder as she walked towards the lobby. I promise, I won't. I called, then turned and headed back out the main doors into the night. The chilly spring air once more smacked me in the face as I emerged under the entrance lights. I looked around, trying to figure out where the valley had taken my car. I decided to wait by the stand where he'd been stationed at and leaned against it, waiting for him to return. After a few minutes, I glanced at the watch on my wrist, noting with a slight pang of irritation that ten minutes had passed. Paula was likely standing next to the check-in counter right now, tapping her foot in the way she always did when she began to get pissed off but didn't want to show it. I turned to look out the other entrance, noting that due to the bright lights above, I couldn't really see out into the darkness just out of range of the lights. That was when the feeling came over me. It sent an electric bolt of lightning up my spine. And as I'd grown up with more than a bit of the rough crowd, it was one that my sense of survival knew well. It was the feeling of being watched. Feeling every muscle in my body tense up, I slowly turned and looked behind me. But nobody was there. The feeling persisted though. Cameras maybe? I always got that sensation when someone was staring at me through CCTV cameras even though I couldn't figure out how or why I knew I was being observed. But as I swept my gaze in the usual areas where I figured cameras would be, I saw none. Either whoever owns this place has an expert in hiding security cameras, or they have none out here. Gutsy move in a city like this. Now the feeling of being watched began to be crept up on by another feeling. It wasn't exactly what you would call fear or dread, but it was more like... The first tiny tendrils of them. Not being able to see who or what was looking at me was a feeling I didn't like. And it made me feel vulnerable as anything. Especially because I had grown to be able to interpret my gut feelings. And this one was telling me that who or whatever was watching me wasn't exactly the friendly type. The sound made me go rigid as a statue. Every one of my five senses instinctively flashing on full alert. For a moment, there was silence, only broken by the seemingly faraway sounds of a police siren starting up somewhere. I began to relax. You're just hearing things, Danny? I chided myself. And now, that one I hadn't imagined. I felt my breath hitch in my chest as I looked around, trying to figure out where the sound had come from, but I couldn't see a damn thing beyond the lights. My heart began to beat a little faster in my chest and I glanced back at the entrance doors. Okay, maybe some time to forget the charger for the night and just go back inside. I took a single step towards the entrance. A hand fell upon my shoulder from behind, heavy and cold. Shit! I involuntarily cried out. I whirled around, my fist already balled up and ready to suck whoever had someone snuck up on me in the face. Instead, I was met with the startled face of the valet as he took a step back. For a moment, we both stood still. And then, I finally let out a shaky breath. Freaking hell, man, I muttered, running a hand over my face. Please don't sneak up on me like that. I let out a soft laugh, trying to ease the tension which had built up inside me. The poor man looked almost apoplectic, raising his hands. I'm so sorry, sir. I didn't realize you didn't hear me coming up behind you. Please forgive me. I let out another soft chuckle raising one hand and waving it to show all was forgiven as I bent down and put my hands on my knees to study myself. After catching my breath, I looked up. It's quite alright, I said simply. He nodded. So is there anything I can help you with? Did you come back out to ask a question? My task flooded back into the forefront of my mind, and I nodded. Yeah, actually, I left something rather important in my car. I forgot to grab it before getting out. Can I possibly have the key and quickly go get it? I'll return my key when I come back. He nodded, his smile returning. Of course, sir. Here you are, he said, holding out my key he still had in his hand, now adorned with a small tag with a number written on it. I took it and managed a small smile. Uh, which direction did you park it in? 
I asked, gesturing out to the dark. He let out a soft laugh of his own and shook his head. Of course, my mistake, sir. He walked to his stand and pulled a small map of the hotel's large parking lot from behind it and pointed to a space near the far right edge. You're parked over here. I quickly examined the map, making a mental note of the route in my mind, then nodded at the man. Thank you, I'll be right back. And with that, I set off. For a moment, staring out into the dark and remembering the feeling and the sound. Get a freaking grip, dude. It was the damn valley, nothing else. I muttered softly to myself and shot a look back over my shoulder. I felt another odd sensation shoot through me as I saw he was staring after me. The same peculiar expression adorned his face. One I couldn't place. Deciding to get it over with so I could get away from him, I took a breath and strode out into the dark. As soon as I was out of sight of the valley, I began to relax. I shook my head and laughed at how jumpy I was. My father had been a prison guard and therefore had prepared me for anything, and I'd grown up in a less than stellar neighborhood. So, why was I jumpy in the middle of a populated city? I chalked it up to nasty stories about what happened to people from the country that visited cities and keep going. The darkened shapes of parked cars passed by me on all sides, too dark for me to make out any distinguishing features. Still, I kept walking, keeping the map of the lot at the forefront of my mind. I stopped, realizing how stupid I was being. All I had to do was tap the lock or unlock button on my key, and I'd instantly know where it was. Snorting at my sudden lack of common sense, I raised the key and clicked the button. A few hundred feet ahead of me, I saw the headlights of my BMW flash like a lighthouse out into the night. Moving quickly, I jogged the distance to the car and walked around to the driver's door. Opening it, I dropped into the driver's seat for a moment. There you are, you little devil. I said as I pulled the charger from the outlet, grabbing the wall adapter and sliding both into my jacket pocket. Stepping back out of the car, I began to shut the door. But something caught my eye. I let out a low whistle. Damn, I whispered to myself as I caught sight of the car I was parked next to. A 1957 Ford Fairlane? Someone staying here has good taste. I admired the two-tone paint job for a moment longer. I then slammed my car door shut, plunging the lot back into darkness. Regardless of how much I wanted to examine further, my wife was waiting for me. I stepped around the front of the car and clicked the lock button. The car beeped twice, signaling the alarm was activated again, and the headlights flashed again for a moment. As they did, I caught sight of the car directly across from me. It was another classic car, looking like an Impala from the early 60s. I allowed myself a small smile. Maybe there's a classic car show happening here soon. The thought cheered me up somewhat. I loved classic cars, and a show of them would be a perfect addition to our honeymoon. But then, all thoughts were wiped away, as in the same moment, my headlights revealed something else. What appeared to be the darkened shape of a man stood just beyond the reach of the lights, standing a little ways behind the Impala. Instantly, I started. I hadn't heard anyone walking around during my trip to the car. And I'm someone who has ears like a hawk, and rarely if ever fail to notice anyone else around. This fact made me feel even more on edge. As my car's headlights died away, the area was plunged again into darkness. For a moment, I didn't move or say anything. Then, I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> um, hello? There was no reply, but I could still barely see the figure still standing there. I decided to try saying something again. Uh, can I help you with anything, man? Still, the figure stayed silent. Now I began to feel alarm bells going off in my head, and I brought myself to my full height, trying to sound as intimidating as possible. Look, man, I don't want any trouble, but I have no problem defending myself if I have to, so find someone else to go try and rob or something. The silence seemed almost deafening, as the seconds drew on with no answer and no movement. Okay, fuck this, I muttered, then aimed the key behind me at my car, pressing the unlock button again. The car beeped and the headlights came on again, illuminating the Impala in front of me and the surrounding area. I felt a pang of surprise, almost shock shoot through me. The figure was gone. What the? I hadn't turned away for more than a split second to make sure I was aiming the key correctly. There wasn't enough time for someone to book it. 
And yet, the area behind the parked car was empty. I felt my pulse begin to race as I looked around, trying to see into the darkness beyond the headlights. But I couldn't see a damn thing. The headlights died away again, allowing the blackness to return. For a few seconds, there was silence. I spun around, the sound almost seeming to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. It came again, the same sound I'd heard while waiting for the valley to return. I'd come to the conclusion it had been him simply dragging his feet along the ground. Now I began to think it had been something else. The sound came again, almost seeming closer. My breath was coming in ragged gasps. My mind suddenly screamed at me to hit the button on my key again. Thrusting my right arm out, I jammed my finger down on the lock button. The headlights flashed on again, and I almost leapt backwards. The figure was back, standing just beyond the edge of the lights to the right, standing in between me and my way back to the hotel. Oh, fuck. I suddenly gripped the key tightly in my fist, remembering the trick my father had taught me on how to use it as a weapon. The figure stayed still and silent, as it had before. I pulled in several lungfuls of air before finally finding my voice. The fuck do you want? Just as before, I got no answer. But for a second, I thought I heard something. Something that almost sounded like a whisper or a mutter coming from the direction of the figure. It seemed almost muffled, just like someone would if they were wearing a mask or something to hide their face. Shit. I whispered. The notion of having to fight off an attacker was looking more and more probable, especially one as highly skilled as this one seemed to be, to move around so silently and quickly. Then, it moved. I couldn't see what it did, but I saw something fly through the air and land with a clink somewhere near me. I feel like an idiot for what I did next to this day. But I foolishly took my eyes off the figure, seemingly on instinct to see what had been thrown my way. By the time I realized my mistake and snapped my head back up, the figure had disappeared again. My eyes widened as I snapped my head around, trying to find where he zoomed off to, but I saw nothing. The sound of a car passing by on the street grabbed my attention, and I quickly looked over to see a pair of headlights and taillights pass by the hotel on the main track. The BMW's headlights again clicked off, plunging me back into darkness and causing my heart to begin pounding again. Where the fuck is he? Almost as if in answer, the sound which had by now begun to fill me with a sense of dread returned. Just as before, I couldn't pinpoint where I was coming from. I quickly shot a glance at the hotel, where I could see the glowing lights of the entrance area. It looked like heaven, with me sitting out in the middle of purgatory here, being stalked by God only knew who. I decided to call out one final time, as a warning, though I doubt it deterred the dude at this point. This is your last warning, fuckface. You come at me, I'll put you in the fucking ground. Now fuck off. As soon as the final words had left my lips, all sound ceased. The scraping sound stopped, and silence fell over the parking lot. But it wasn't a normal kind of silence, as if the person had heeded my warning and split. It was a deadly silence, one which was so tension-filled it was almost palpable. Instantly, I realized I just made a huge mistake with my threat. Oh shit, I whispered under my breath as I looked around. I couldn't hear a damn thing, and standing in the darkness for this long was making me feel more vulnerable by the second. My breath was hitching in my throat, and I felt the first tendrils of genuine fear creep up on me. I wanted to make a break for it and dash for the entrance, but where I didn't know where the figure was, I didn't want to run blindly straight into them. And so, I made a split-second decision. I would hit the lock button on my key one final time to make sure they weren't still off to my right. If I didn't see them, I would book it and not look back. I swallowed hard, realizing my throat had gone as dry as sandpaper without realizing it. Slowly, I raised the key back up, pointing it towards my car. My heart was now thundering in my chest as if I'd just run a marathon, and for a moment I hesitated. Then. I hit the button. The car beeped and the headlights pierced the black veil, banishing it away. I steeled myself and looked to the right, expecting the figure to be there again. Instead, I saw nothing. For a second, I stared out, trying to see any minute detail. But the figure was gone. I let out 
a shuddering breath. For a moment, a shred of relief passing through me as I thought they had heeded my threat and took off. That's when the realization slammed into me like a freezing wave. I just left my back completely exposed. Oh, fuck my life. In that moment, the feeling of being watched returned, along with the feeling of dread. And I whirled around to face the other way. But I only got halfway when I was slammed into. The impact lifted me off my feet and sent me flying through the air before slamming into the side of a parked car. Before my brain had a chance to catch up, I felt myself being grabbed by the shoulder and flung to the ground. The pavement slammed into my shoulder, but my instincts had now kicked in. I slammed myself onto my back and looked up to see the figure falling towards me, one arm outstretched. I rolled myself hard to the left, and with not a moment to spare, I heard the sound of something heavy slamming into the concrete. Hard enough, I swear I heard it crack. The guy just tried bashing my head in. My mind screamed at me. Scrambling to my feet, I saw them do the same, squaring their shoulders to charge me again. Realizing I did not have the advantage in this fight, I did the only smart thing I knew to do. I turned and sprinted for the hotel's entrance. The darkened shape of the other parked cars flew by me in a blur as I ran, my ragged breaths seeming to echo back at me. My lungs began to feel as though they were on fire, a consequence of not working out much in the last few months. But I kept running. I could hear my pursuer behind me, and they were gaining. Their footfalls seemed even louder than mine as I could hear them more clearly. The entrance was just in front of me now, not even a hundred feet away. I felt something brush against my back. Either I'd almost been grabbed, or my attacker had just taken a swing at me with his weapon while running. The realization that they were that close sent a new burst of adrenaline coursing through my veins, giving me my second wind and allowing me a new burst of speed. I ran faster than I ever had since my high school track and field days. Still, I could feel my pursuer close behind me, but I didn't dare look back. And then, I burst from the darkness into the lights of the entrance. I could see the valley shoot up from where he had been drifted off behind the stand. He dashed out from behind it, running towards me. Sir, what's the matter? He exclaimed. I finally gathered my courage and whirled around, expecting to see someone directly behind me. Instead, I saw I was alone. Completely alone. Snapping my head around, I saw no sign of my attacker beyond the lights. What the fucking hell? For a moment, I stood there, trying to catch my breath. Then I turned to the valet. I, I was just attacked by someone. I choked out between great gasps of air. Someone tried attacking me while I was, I was at my car. Instantly, I saw the valet's eyes harden. He turned and ran back to his stand and pulled a corded phone handset from behind it. I realized it must connect him to the inside. He spoke into it for a moment, and then he hung up. Not even a minute later, a large burly man wearing a security uniform jogged out of the entrance. Stay here, sir, he said to me as he and the valet jogged past me into the dark. Be careful, I called after them. And then, I was alone again. I didn't dare leave the seeming safety of the lighted area, and instead stood by the valet stand for them to return. As the minutes dragged on, Terrible thoughts tore through my mind. Thoughts of the two men being ambushed and knocked out. Or worse. A few minutes later though, the two men returned. The security guard shook his head at me. Whoever it was, sir, they're gone. His words disheartened me somewhat. In my mind, I knew they had long since have vamoosed. But part of me had hoped he'd be caught skulking around another car. I let out a sigh and nodded. So now what? I asked, still trying to return my breathing to normal. The guard shrugged. I'll call the police in the morning and make a report. Until then, there's nothing we can do. The valet spoke up. I spoke to the concierge in the lobby. They're going to bump you up to one of our vacant premiere suites as a way to apologize for this incident. He gestured towards the entrance. Your wife is waiting for you by the check-in desk. Head on inside and put this out of your mind. I don't think you'll be troubled again during your stay. He flashed me a perfectly white-toothed smile. For a minute, I stood there. I felt almost flabbergasted at how calmly both men were taking the situation. But then, I reminded myself. 
It's Las Vegas, Danny. This shit probably happens on the regular here. Even still, my mental words did little to comfort me. Despite the valet's words, something inside me silently whispered that it wasn't the end of it. But then I shook my head. I was letting the attack, however horrifying and terrible, cloud my judgment. For a moment, I'd almost allow myself to think that the entire hotel felt off. Wrong. That something about it just didn't gel. But I rationalized it was all due to my experience. Besides, they're bumping us to one of the luxury suites. They can't be that bad. Especially when you were going to stay in the economy suite in the other place. Feeling satisfied with my mental answer, I nodded at the valet and handed back my car keys. Making sure I still had the paper slip in my pants pocket, I followed the guard back inside. The warm, old school style decor seemed to put me at ease as I walked from the entrance hall into the lobby itself. Older style places always had that effect on me. As I approached the check-in desk, my mind turned over the possibility of cancelling my other reservation and simply making this place where Paula and I would stay for the entire duration of our honeymoon. Speaking of Paula, my wife stood by the check-in desk, turning to me with a worried look on her face. Welp, I'm pretty sure she found out what happened, I thought. I'd been churning over the idea of simply not telling her about the attack, but it seemed the choice was out of my hands. She ran to me, cupping my face in both of her hands. Darling, are you alright? She asked me, her voice carrying a trace of desperation in it. I took a second, and then locked eyes with her and nodded. Yeah, yeah, I'm alright. I looked harder at her. I take it you heard what happened to me? I asked. She nodded. The man here picked up the phone. A look of relief crossed her face. Oh, Danny, I'm just glad you're okay, she said. I refrained from telling her exactly how close I'd come to not being okay. I am too, I admit it. I'm just glad we didn't start out both 2023 and our honeymoon with me in the hospital. It'll suck trying to woo you from a hospital bed or wheelchair. She let out a soft laugh, shaking her head at my joke. I leaned forward and kissed her on the forehead. Come on, I said softly. Let's check in and get up to our room. We both need to rest. She nodded, and I glanced at my watch. It was close to four in the morning. We approached the check-in desk again. The man standing behind it, looking up and giving an award-winning smile. I'm glad to see you're all right, sir, he said. His voice contained what seemed like genuine empathy, and it cemented my idea further to propose to stay here our entire stay. Thank you very much for saying so, I replied. He nodded. Of course, sir. And in addition to bumping you to a premier suite as compensation, please allow us to provide you with a few sets of tickets for you and your lovely wife, both to see shows going on right here in our hotel and in the city itself, as our way to apologize. Paula and I exchanged a rather surprised but happy look. Well, maybe it might have started out on a bad note, I thought. But at this pace... This is shaping to be a better honeymoon than I thought. Paula smiled at the men. Thank you ever so much, sir, she said, gripping my arms. You see, my husband and I just got married, and this is our honeymoon. A smile, almost wider than I've ever seen someone give, crossed the man's face. He held out both of his arms. Then, my dear, a bit congratulations to you and your lucky husband. He gestured all around him. And I bid you both welcome. Welcome to the Toons Hotel and Casino. Danny? I grunted, resisting the literal call of the waking world and rolling over, burying my face into the pillow. Danny? The call came again, still soft, but a little more insistent. I let out a sound, which to me sounded like, what? But in retrospect, was likely a little more than a grumble. A moment later, I felt hands gently shaking my shoulder, and I reluctantly allowed the waking world to chase away the last vestiges of sleep. Danny, wake up, darling. It's almost noon. Paula's words caused me to open my eyes and look at the old school alarm clock on the bedside table. She was right. According to the two hands, it was 11.43. All right, all right, I'm up. I grumbled, 
The words actually passing from my lips as I forced myself to sit up in bed. Paula sat on the edge of the bed next to me, already dressed in a white button-up shirt and pair of slacks. A smile played over her lips as our eyes locked. Good morning, sleeping beauty, she proclaimed. How do you feel? I rubbed my eyes, feeling the throb from last night's rather excessive drinking session already starting. Aside from the Jack Hammer team already going to work behind my temples, I'm great, I said sarcastically, earning a laugh from her. Well, you did decide to go more than a little overboard with the alcohol, darling. I gave her a sly look. Maybe, but you didn't seem to mind that when we went to bed. Paula's cheeks turned red, and she gave me a gentle push, giggling softly. I threw the covers back, sliding my feet down onto the carpeted floor. Anyways, what you've been up to while I've been snoring away? I asked. She gestured to the old school television, which stood at the foot of the bed. I slept like a log as well, after I ordered up some room service, see what sort of stuff Vegas has on its channels. She gave me a perplexed look. But it's the weirdest thing. All they were showing were reruns of extremely old TV shows from 60 years ago or so. Although, I did enjoy this sort of neat game show that was playing called I've Got a Secret. They should really bring that back. I shrugged my shoulders. I guess they're really playing up the old school angle with this hotel. Sort of stay with us and take a step back in time sort of thing. I allowed an annoyed look to fall over my face. Although I'm not sure I'll leave a glowing review where I was forced to use my lucky vintage bill. When we checked in, it had ended up being a slight bit of a hassle. For whatever reason, neither of our credit cards were able to be accepted. It had been a surprise, as we've never had a problem using them before. And since we both decided not to carry cash with us on the trip and get it out of an ATM once we reached the hotel, I was forced to use something rather precious to me. It was a vintage thousand dollar bill, something I'd bought years ago, before the prices on them on eBay went through the roof. Luckily, even though they haven't been circulated in a long time, they can apparently still be used as a legal tender since it has been accepted by the manager. To say it was painful to hand it over though was an understatement. The only thing that made it somewhat bearable however was the amount we had to pay. Almost shockingly, it cost a fraction of what the quoted price for the Venetian had been. For that I was grateful. Paula rubbed my shoulder. Well, at least you bought two of them from that collector. You still have the other one at home. I gave a small smile and nodded at her. God bless this woman for always helping me look on the bright side. Well, let me get dressed, and then we'll head downstairs. I'd like to get something for brunch myself, at least a cup of coffee, then we'll plan out what to do today. All the tickets they gave us will give us plenty to do for the next two weeks. The hotel apparently hosted a nightly show called Casino de Paris, a sort of retro, burlesque style performance which we'd been given tickets to watch for almost the entire duration of our stay. In addition, we'd been given two tickets to shows playing around the city. They were all for tribute acts though, such as one for Frank Sinatra and Friends tribute act, which was playing over at another hotel and casino I'd never heard of before called The Sands. Paula smiled and hopped off the bed ecstatically as I stood up and walked to my suitcase. Ten minutes later, I'd finished getting dressed slipping into a fresh t-shirt and pair of jeans, quickly brushed my teeth, and the two of us were locking our room and heading for the elevator. A fresh-faced man who apparently operated the elevator controls greeted us as the doors opened. Going down, sir? He asked as we stepped into it. Yeah, lobby please, I said, still feeling a bit hungover and sluggish. Obediently, he pressed the button and the doors closed, our descent beginning down to the lobby. As the soft elevator music pierced my ears, I looked around and noticed that the elevator operator was eyeing me rather strangely. I looked down at myself. I don't see anything on my clothes that would warrant him looking at me like that, I thought. Finally, he spoke. If you don't mind me asking, sir, are you two from the same place as the others? He asked. The question threw me for a bit of a loop. Uh, what you mean? I asked in return. He shrugged his shoulders. Nothing, sir. Just, we sometimes have guests who drop in. Who? He shot me another quick look before finishing. A look. Well, like they're not from around here. 
he shook his head. I'm sorry, sir. That was rude of me. My curiosity just got the better of me. For a moment, I stayed silent. The awkwardness and, frankly, weirdness of the man's question making me feel equal amounts perplexed and weirded out. But I resolved to be polite. I shook my head. It's quite all right, I said, and let the silence fall over us again. I felt a particularly sharp stab of pain behind my eyes, and I closed them, reaching up and rubbing my thumb and index finger into them. Blue spots exploded in the darkness behind my eyelids, and I let out a soft groan. Hey, do you know where the nearest place is I can get a bottle of aspirin? I softly asked the man, still rubbing my eyes. He didn't respond. My shoulders slumped, and I let out a soft sigh. Excuse me, sir? I said a little louder. I still received no reply. Feeling a little frustrated, compounded by my pounding head, I pulled my hand away from my face and opened my eyes, ready to give the elevator operator a piece of my mind. But any verbal lashing I had built up in my throat died away. The elevator was completely empty, aside from me. What? Both Paul and the attendant had seemingly vanished into thin air. I twisted around, looking behind me to see nothing but wood paneling. Okay, what the fuck is going on? I know I didn't hallucinate stepping into the elevator with my wife or seeing the attendant. I fought back the rapidly rising waves of confusion and worry, stepping forward and hitting the already lit up button for the lobby two more times, as if my repeated jabs would somehow spur it on quicker. But it simply continued descending, unhurried. Finally, the loud thing announcing its arrival to the lobby sounded, and the doors slid open to reveal pitch blackness. The only light was what spilled out from the elevator, lighting up a long rectangular stretch of floor. Okay, what the actual fuck? I whispered quietly. I most certainly wasn't taking a damn step out of the elevator into the darkness, not when I had no idea what was happening. I remember my phone suddenly, reaching into my pocket and pulling it out. Snapping the screen open, I found the flashlight icon and hit it. Instantly, a bright white beam of light sprang forward, shooting out into the dark. I stepped as close as I dared to the open doors, and leaning out slightly, panned the light around. It bounced off the massive empty shape of a secondary employee desk, a luggage cart piled high with suitcases sitting unattended in front of it. There wasn't a soul inside. Is there a power outage or something? I wondered. But no, it wouldn't explain the absence of everyone. Maybe there's a solar eclipse or something happening outside, and everyone's gone to watch it. I pushed that idea away as well. I hadn't heard of any eclipse coming up in the near future. And again, it wouldn't explain why the people behind the counter and all the guests disappeared. Not to mention where the hell Paula and the elevator guy went. That was when the light in the elevator began to flicker. My head snapped up to look at it as it began to rapidly blink off and back on again. Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Really? It was like the inevitable, predictable conclusion of a damn horror movie. One of the oldest tropes in the book. Swallowing hard, I looked around to see if there was anything I could snatch up to defend myself if need be. But there was nothing remotely in that category, barring if I wanted to try and rip the metal door from the elevator's wiring system off its hinges. I felt my pulse quicken as the light flickered on and off quicker. Every time it plunged me into complete darkness, save for my phone's flashlight, my heart pounded in my chest like a drum. I had no idea what the hell to do. It felt as though I were in a lose-lose situation. A heavy hand suddenly fell on my shoulder, its fingers feeling as though they were jamming into the skin. I let out a half-scream as I attempted to twist around to see who had grabbed me, but the grip tightened, shooting a wave of pain through me, and I was thrown forward. I sailed through the air like I was a rag doll before crashing through the marble floor. The breath was driven from my lungs, and I let out a cut-off cry of pain. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, and I flipped onto my back, sitting up as quickly as I could. I still clutched my phone in my hands, somehow having held onto it during my short flight, and I aimed it back towards the still open elevator doors. I felt all the blood drain from my face as the beam landed on a figure. It was dressed in all black, 
Either that, or it was all black. All except for its eyes. It was as if whoever, or whatever I was staring at, had a ski mask over their face, made of a material I'd never seen before. What seemed to be like holes had been made around the eyes, and the ones that stared back at me almost looked to be human. Except, no human I'd ever met ever had that much statistically in them before. The figure stepped out of the elevator, and a pang of absolute terror coursed through me as I saw it was holding what appeared to be a fire axe in its right hand, one which seemed to already have blood on its blade and handle. Oh hell in a handbasket. I scrambled to my feet, attempting to put as much distance between myself and the axe-wielding figure. Then, the elevator doors closed, plunging the lobby, safe for my phone's tiny flashlight into utter blackness. My heart felt as though it were about to explode out of my chest as I saw the figure take another step towards me. It was slow and deliberate, almost as if it were trying to anticipate my next move. I quickly turned around, making sure to keep the menacing shape in my peripheral vision as I searched for somewhere to go. I knew the second I made a break for it, the figure would make a lunge for me. I couldn't explain how I knew, but I could simply tell that it was waiting for me to make the first move and it was relishing the tense moments in between. An idea suddenly surged forward in my brain, one which, if I didn't time it perfectly, would likely end up with me pulling a dick hollow in from The Shining and ending up with an axe in my stomach, or my head. I tensed up every muscle in my body, looking towards the left, as though I were about to run towards the entrance hallway. I saw the figure also tense up, now holding the axe with both hands. I suddenly put all force into my legs, using the floor almost as a sort of springboard. Years of track and field instinct kicked in, and I faint, starting to dash to the left. Instantly, the figure was a blur of motion, raising the axe and dashing silently towards me. I turned and shot backwards, forced to turn the light away from my attacker as I made my leap. Behind me, I could practically feel the air being parted by the axe, and a second after beginning my leap, heard it smash into the marble floor where I'd been standing not a second ago. But I was sailing through the air, praying I had calculated correctly. Fortunately, I did, as the edge of the desk passed underneath me, and I landed on the floor behind it. On the other side, I finally heard the figure let out a sound. It sounded like a cry of frustration and rage, and it motivated me to leap to my feet faster than I thought possible. I flashed the light around catching the heart-stopping view of the shape running towards the desk, raising the axe over its head. I didn't wait to see what happened next. Instead, I ran for the open partition which separated the employee area from the rest of the lobby. Behind me, I heard the figure vault over the counter, landing with a heavy thud on the floor. But I had already ran from behind the counter. I knew I couldn't make it to the entrance lobby, and instead, I aimed for the first door my light caught in its beam. It was a silver metal door marked, employees only, thank you. A moment later, I smashed into it with my shoulder, the door crashing into the wall with a massive bang. Behind me, I heard the pounding footsteps of my pursuer, and without knowing where I was going, I ran. I had wound up in some sort of employee hallway, likely one of many which wound their way through the hotel and casino. A rack of sheets flew by in a blur on my left, and I came to a T-junction, opting to turn right. I heard the door to the lobby smash open as the figure entered the hallway, and I used the sound as motivation to run faster, despite the fire that seemed to be burning in my leg muscles. A few seconds later, I came to another T-junction, this one seemingly identical to the last. I chose to run to the left this time, but as I did, something I saw for a split second caught my eye. It was a security camera, one which had been aimed down the hallway in the direction I'd come from. I didn't have much time to see all the details on it, as I was too busy running for my life. But there had been enough time to notice one particular detail. The red blinking light, showing it was recording, had flashed out into the darkness. The realization fled away from my brain, as I was too preoccupied with staying a hallway or two ahead of my pursuer. I could still hear it behind me. The thundering of its footsteps drowned mine out entirely. Ahead of me, I saw another metal door this one with no lettering on it. The hallway also broke off to the left and right, but I'd already decided I was going through the door. With any luck, I'd find a place to hide for a while, allowing the figure to assume I kept running in a different direction and break away from me. 
it would give me not only a chance to catch my rapidly dwindling breath, but also double back and find the door I'd enter the back hallways too. From there, I could run to the entrance. My plan said, I poured on all the power I had remaining in me. The door flying up to greet me, I lowered my shoulder and smashed into it, flying into the room, where I slammed into something which knocked me backwards. Halfway back into the hallway, I let out a cry of pain as I landed on my ass, the stabbing feeling traveling up my tailbone and spine. I snapped my phone up, aiming the flashlight into the room to see what it slammed into. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that my heart stopped. My breath caught in my throat, and I felt a tidal wave of abject horror flood into every fiber of my being. The beam had caught a figure, standing less than a foot or two away from where I lay in a crumpled heap on the floor, one that looked identical to the one which had been chasing me. Like the other one, this too carried an axe, though this one had no blood on it. I twisted around, wondering if my pursuer had shot down an alternate corridor to get ahead of me, anticipating my move. But no, I could hear both, and now see it running down the hallway towards me. Towards us. I spun back towards the newcomer, and felt, if possible, an even greater wave of horror shoot through me. The figure wasn't alone in the room beyond. A second had moved into the beam of the light. It was joined by a third, then a fourth, and a fifth. In the span of ten seconds, the light showed at least seven or eight of the figures in the room. Behind me, I heard my pursuer slow to a speed walk. I began to scramble backwards on my hands and knees, out towards the right branch of the new hallway. The figures from the room followed, spilling out in slow, silent pursuit. They met my pursuer there, where they stood, still silently, watching me scramble away. Then, they began to laugh. They all began to laugh. It sounded like human laughter, men's laughter, but it was filled with absolute evil and malice and they slowly began to walk towards me. My scrambling intensified, and in my hasty retreat, I forgot to keep watching where I was going. I felt something slam into the back of my head, while simultaneously a painful chap poked me in my left arm, the arm which had been holding my phone. On reflex, I dropped the phone as I jerked my arm back. It clattered to the floor, the beam of light aiming directly up at the ceiling. I looked behind me and saw it backed into another linen rack. The stabbing sensation had been me hitting a sharp edge, which had pierced the skin. I twisted back around to see how close the figures had gotten, and I let out a half scream. All of the figures stood almost directly over me. They had used my moment of distraction to get in close, cutting off any way for me to escape. My breathing came in short, ragged gasps as I realized what was about to happen to me. As if they'd read my thoughts, all of the figures began raising their axes. The almost maddening sound of their laughter returned as they held them high over their heads. My life suddenly flashed before my eyes, snapshots of being a young child, a teenager, turning 18, meeting Paula. Then, a single clear thought. Oh fuck, this is gonna hurt. I raised my arms in front of my face in some pathetic attempt to ward off the multiple blades about to cut me to ribbons. The blades suddenly whipped down at me, and I closed my eyes, letting out one last scream in defiance of my fate. Danny! The voice cut through the sudden silence, one which was only broken by soft sound of elevator music. Realizing I wasn't feeling the piercing pain from multiple axe blades, I slowly lowered my arms and opened my eyes. Paula and the elevator operator knelt by my side, both had a look of major concern on their face. I became aware I was back in the elevator and that I was laying on the floor. For a moment, I couldn't find the words to speak. Then, what? what happened? Paula let out a huge sigh of relief as that I had answered. We had a moment where the elevator went offline for a moment. It went black for a few seconds. You must have fallen asleep standing during it, because right when the power came back on, you suddenly began screaming. Her voice trailed off, and I realized how frightened my wife was. But I was still attempting to make sense of it all. But it felt, it felt so real. I thought to myself, the blackout, the figures pursuing me, the pain. 
it felt real. My mind seemed to race at a million miles an hour. The elevator attendant spoke up. Did you get a decent night's sleep, sir? He asked with a tone of concern. For a moment, I debated on my answer, and then decided to speak truthfully. Honestly, no, I said weakly. My wife and I didn't get much sleep, and I drank a lot. The man nodded, a relieved smile crossing his face. And that's what I figured. Sleep deprivation combined with a large amount of alcohol will cause you to fall asleep for short periods of time and experience horrifying dreams. He reached down and grabbed my arm, pulling me to my feet. My older brother is a doctor, it's how I know about that, he explained. I felt Paula grab my arm to help study me. As I mulled the man's words over in my head, they made sense. A lot more sense than what? Suddenly appearing in some alternate reality? Where everyone had disappeared, everything was black, and figures with axes were chasing you? I nodded, trying to push away a small voice in the back of my head that attempted to argue it, despite the man's words, and the rationalizations my brain was attempting to make that it had been real. But it seemed that the rational part of my brain won out. I pushed away the nagging voice and attempted to bring myself back to reality. Are you sure you're alright, darling? Paula asked me her voice soft and slow. I looked at her, then nodded my head after a moment. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I let out a deep breath. I guess the incident that happened last night in the parking lot is still in the back of my mind as all. Well. She nodded understandingly. That makes sense, she said, then smiled and leaned forward to kiss me. Just, please, don't scare me like that again. I allowed myself a small smile and pulled her close to me. I'll try my best not to, I said. A moment later, the elevator let out a soft ding and the doors opened, revealing the brightly lit and bustling lobby. I turned to Paula. Go ahead for a second, sweetheart, I told her quietly. I want to tip the attendant for helping us. For a moment, she seemed concerned with leaving me alone, and then she nodded stepping out of the elevator. I turned back to the man, pulling my wallet out from my back pocket. Look sir, I'd like to give you something for your troubles with me. I said as I rifled through the massive amount of bills which now filled it from breaking up my thousand dollar bill the night before. The man began to protest, but I held up a hand. I insist, it's my way of saying thank you. He looked as though he wanted to try and protest again, but instead he stayed silent and nodded. I finally decided on giving him a 50. With inflation being the way it was, everyone could use a helping generous hand every now and then. I pulled it from my wallet and pushed the bill into his hand. For a moment, he stared down at it, and I saw an almost stunned look pass over his face. He looked as though I handed him a solid gold bar or something. Wow, other guests must not tip these people that hot if he has this much of a reaction to just 50 bucks. Shaking my head at how sad that was, I nodded to him and stepped out of the elevator, replacing my wallet in my pocket. I turned back to look at him one final time before the elevator closed, and I involuntarily took a step backwards. The man had fixed an odd and rather intense gaze at me, one which was unblinking. I can only describe it as more than a little eerie. And then, the elevator doors closed. I let out a bewildered snort and turned away. I've got to post a tweet about that odd encounter, I thought, and reached into my pocket for it. But it wasn't there. What the hell? I muttered, checking my other pockets. I knew for a fact I'd slip my phone into my pocket before we left the room. In fact, I'd even said something about it to Paula. Wait a minute, honey. I'm not leaving my phone after charging it all night, I'd said. I replayed getting up from the floor of the elevator in my mind. Had I seen it dropped when I stared down at my feet for a moment? No, I hadn't. I raised my left hand to scratch the back of my scalp, a coping mechanism for stress I'd done since I was a child. A sudden stabbing pain coursed through my arm, causing me to let out a bit of a gasp. Lowering my arm quickly, 
I brought my other hand around to feel the back of it. Another ripple of pain emanated from the area, and I pulled my fingers back to see small droplets of blood on them. The hell did that happen? I muttered quietly to myself. The memory of the waking nightmare suddenly flashed to my mind. I remembered scrambling back, straight into the linen rack which had stabbed into my left arm, exactly where the wound was. A shiver suddenly shot up my spine. It was just a nightmare. A dream, wasn't it? I shook my head. It's just a fucking coincidence, you moron. I muttered. You hurt yourself in the elevator, that's all. Get a damn grip and stop going mental on me. Shaking away the nagging thought, I stepped forward to rejoin my wife. Together, we walked the length of the lobby until we reached the main section and approached the check-in counter. The same man as last night, whose name according to the name tag pinned to his chest, was Arthur, spotted us and smiled wide. Ah, good morning to the two newlywed lovebirds, he exclaimed, holding out his arms in a similar manner to how he had last night. How did you two sleep last night? Paula let out a snort. We slept okay, but I think this one, she gestured to me, is going to lay off so much of the alcohol for the rest of the honeymoon. The man Arthur let out a good-natured laugh. Well, I can't fault them. The first few weeks of being married are always a joyous occasion, but sometimes you can overdo it. I let out a snort. You're not kidding, I grumbled. Paula turned to give me an amused look, then looked back to Arthur. Do you have any place that serves coffee and either a late breakfast or lunch here? I'd like to get some food and caffeine into him. Arthur let out another good-natured chuckle, then gestured to the front hallway. Of course, we stopped serving breakfast at 11, but if you like lunch, our fabulous restaurant, Dome of the Sea, is just outside, a short walk across the parking lot. He leaned forward. In between you and I, their lunch menu is to tie for. He let out another laugh, causing both of us to chuckle at the man's cheesy pun. I nodded. All right, thank you, Arthur, I said. He raised his hands. Don't mention it. It's what I'm here for. He cleared his throat as we turned away. By the way, there is a special show happening tonight. Taking place at the Casino de Paris, it's called La Parisienne, direct from friends, and there's going to be a special guest tonight in it. He looked around, then grinned at us. Have either of you heard of a singer and actress named Diana Dors? I looked to Paul and shrugged, my mind drawing a blank. She returned the gesture. No, unfortunately not. I admit it, turning back to the man. He gave a shocked face. Well, then you're in for a treat tonight. Just use two of your tickets for the other show. They'll be valid for this one. And just wait until you hear the singing voice this dame has on her. I'm just happy she's been a regular on our stage for the last year or two. I looked to Paula and gave her an interested look. She nodded. Sure, thanks for the heads up. We'll check it out. I declared, then rubbed my pounding temples. After I get coffee and food. He laughed, then waved us away. Have a lovely day, you two. He called after us. We strode outside into the hot, arid air. As we left the shade of the entrance, I shot a look up. A large statue of what looked to be an Arabic sultan stood atop the entrance area, the yellow letters spelling out dunes stretching out to either side of him. One hell of a mascot, I thought. As we approached the entrance to the restaurant, a huge circular building, something caught my eye. It was an old newspaper vending machine, the kind with an all-glass front. Holy shit, I haven't seen one of those newspaper machines in years. I thought they stopped using them. I stopped Paula for a second to drop a quarter into the machine and opened it, pulling a newspaper out and tucking it under my arm without looking. I'd read it inside. What, trying to act sophisticated and old school to match the hotel, darling? My wife asked with an amused smile. I laughed, then gently pushed her forward and into the double doors. The inside of the restaurant was, to use a single word, beautiful. It lived up to its name, done up in an aquatic theme with an ornate dark blue roof stretching overhead. Water-filled grotto-like areas stood around the tables, and surprisingly, 
a live band played in one corner. As we were led to our table, I noticed something which threw me for a bit of a loop. All of the people having lunch in here were done up to the nines in clothes. All the men wore suits and hats, looking like they just come from a big power meeting, and the women all wore very fancy looking dresses. That wasn't the only surprising part about them. All the suits and dresses looked old-fashioned to put a word on it. Even the younger patrons, once about our age, were dressed up that way. They all seemed to stare at us as we passed, as if we had each grown two heads. Okay, that's honestly a bit weird. But I put it out of my mind as we sat down and ordered our meals. The coffee was brought to me immediately, and the hot liquid pouring down my throat felt like a god's hand. It almost made me forget about the horrifying experience in the elevator, as well as my lost phone and injured arm. Both which I couldn't honestly explain, and instead kept mentally pushing away. The positive atmosphere and calming music seemed to help. I set the mug down and picked up the newspaper from the table. So, what do you want to do for the rest of the day until the show tonight, babe? I asked Paula as I turned the front page towards me. Well, I was thinking we could take a drive up and down the strip and get a feel for all the casinos and restaurants. Then we could find a place to maybe stop and play a few slots. I know you've always told me they're rigged, but I'd still like to play them at least once. Oh, and then, if we have time, she continued on. But I wasn't listening to her anymore. Every sound in the restaurant seemed to have turned down, like someone with a television remote had hit the volume down button. I swear I could hear the blood rushing to my head, and I felt my mouth go dry as cotton. My heart began to beat almost as fast as it had in my chase, real or imaginary, as I felt as though the whole world were spinning. I kept staring at the front page of the paper, at the picture on the front of it, and at something else. Finally, a sound cut through the seemingly muted noises. Danny? What's wrong, darling? Paula asked me, reaching out and taking my free hand in hers. I lowered the newspaper and stared at her. My face must have been pale as a sheet, because I saw extreme concern crease her beautiful features. What? She insisted. It took a moment to find my voice. Uh, Paula, sweetheart? I said weakly. We, we might have a problem. Silent for a moment. What? She asked, then looked at the newspaper. I saw her put two and two together. What did you read? She finally asked, slowly. I set the paper down in the center of the table, turning it so she could read it. I saw her lean in and mouth the words. I saw her expression change from concern to utter shock. She snapped her head at me, as if to search my eyes for an explanation. But I had none to give. The picture on the front of the page was of John F. Kennedy. I can't remember the exact headline it proclaimed above it. Though, I know it contained the words, President Kennedy. But even now, almost three months being back, I can still perfectly recall the date displayed under the newspaper's name. July 22nd, 1962. So, we've somehow ended up 61 years in the past? Paula spoke in a voice which betrayed the bundle of nerves she'd become ever since she'd seen the date on the newspaper I'd bought. It currently sat on the glass coffee table in our hotel room as quiet as a church mouse. And yet, the picture of a man who had been assassinated only a year later might as well have had a tornado siren growing out of it. To say our lunch, as delicious as it had been, had been permeated with an awkward, strained silence would be an understatement of massive proportions. As soon as we'd finished eating and paid the bill, the two of us had practically dashed back to the relative safety and privacy of our room to talk and try to get our heads around our current predicament. Paula finally stopped pacing back and forth and looked at me, wrapping a lock of her hair around her finger and biting her lip. But how? 
she finally asked. I shook my head, unable to give her the answer she so desperately sought for. I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination. Hell, I'm barely qualified to work as a manager for my company in the first place. I honestly don't know, honey. I said quietly. Up until today, I thought time travel was impossible. Something only talked about seriously by people nostalgic for an era they could never return to. Or by those without both feet in reality. But it seems they were right the whole time. I trailed off, shaking my head as my mind fought to push away what I could plainly see in front of me to be true. I stood up from the couch and walked across to the balcony door. It faced out onto the main drag. And looking down, I watched the endless procession of vintage cars move up and down the boulevard. No, not vintage cars, Danny. My mind whispered to me. They're modern day cars for everyone. Everyone but you. I turned away and back to my wife, who was now perched on the edge of the couch. She looked up at me, a mixture of confusion and worry filling her face. Crossing back over, I sat down next to her and wrapped her in my arms. I sighed. After a moment, she pulled away and looked at me, nodding in appreciation. Look, however we've ended up in this situation, we need to keep a level head here. I said to her, we need to keep calm and make sure, above all else, we stay okay. Paula stayed quiet for a moment, and then nodded. I agree. She stood up from the couch and began pacing again, a trademark sign she was deep in thought. Okay. The first thing we need to do is to make sure we don't stand out any more than necessary, she continued. So, we'll call down to the reception and ask them where the nearest clothing store is. We'll get ourselves some clothes to blend in with everyone else. She suddenly looked up at me. But, what are we going to do about money? She asked. I searched my mind for older facts about the past I learned from hours of scouring the internet. Well, we're already very well set for money. Because if I remember correctly, after what we spent on the hotel room and lunch, we still have about the equivalent of eight or nine grand left. But I know that won't last forever. So, I say, with a lot of caution, we try and bet a little money here and there on things such as horse and greyhound racing. Maybe even try some of the slot machines. But not too much though. Vegas in the 60s was still as rigged as Vegas in the 21st century after all. Paula nodded seemingly satisfied with my answer. Well, that'll possibly help. We have two weeks booked here, so we'll be able to hopefully find a way to get. She trailed off and looked at me. Danny, how are we going to get back to our own time? I ran my fingers through my hair. She'd asked the very question I'd been pondering ever since lunch. I sighed. It'd be so much easier if we knew how we got in here in the first place. Then... And then we could simply do the reverse to return, if that would even work. I honestly don't know, sweetheart. I admit it. But we'll cross that bridge when we do. A light bulb suddenly went off inside my head. And I shot up to my feet, like I'd been struck by lightning. The elevator operator. For a moment, Paula's face remained blank. Then realization crossed her face. Of course, she exclaimed. He'd mentioned how others dressed like us had shown up before. That means others have practically traveled back in time. And it means they may have found a way back. A smile crossed her face. If we can talk to him, maybe others who've seen them before, we might be able to figure out what they did. I nodded, already having to come to the same conclusion as her, and returned her smile. And that is why this woman is my wife. She has both beauty and brains. Until we're able to, though... I say, let's try and enjoy our time here. We're in a time neither of us thought we'd ever see outside of pictures and films. So let's take it all in while we can. Go to the shows, see the sights, do all we can while we can. Paula grinned. Took the thought right out of my head, darling, she said, crossing to me and wrapping her arms around my neck before pressing her lips to mine. We've always heard about the swinging 60s. Time to find out how swinging they really were. Unfortunately, it turned out that the elevator operator we seen that morning had the next week off and wouldn't be returning until the following Friday. So, in the meantime, Paul and I did our best to enjoy ourselves. 
it really wasn't that hard. In fact, 1962, especially in Vegas, was extremely fun. The two of us each bought several sets of period clothing as we planned. Wearing a suit outside of company meetings felt incredibly weird, I must say. But man did Paula look stunning when she walked out of the woman's clothing shop. Clad in an ornate white dress with straps which crisscrossed underneath her neck and a pair of high heels. Whoa. I breathed as she stepped outside and twirled around for me to see, causing her face to turn red. My plan to try and make money off the casino games and betting actually worked out better than I thought it would. Paul had always been amazing at card games such as poker and blackjack, while thanks to my old man and his love of visiting the horse and dog tracks in the 90s and early 2000s when he was still alive, I picked up on how to more often than not pick up the contestants most likely to win. Between the two of us, we made over $3,000 in 3 days, more than enough to cover what we need. And to say nothing about the amazing shows we went to see, watching legends of the previous generations such as Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. perform at the Sands was nothing short of amazing. Sitting in the huge room filled with a hazy cloud of cigarette smoke as Old Blue Eyes and company pelted out some of their biggest hits. The shows which the Toons had on were amazing as well. Arthur had been right when he said that Diana Doors had an amazing singing voice. When we sat down at our table and saw her walk out onto stage that first night, Paula gasped aloud. For my part, so did I. The singer and actress looked uncannily like my wife. You could be her younger freaking sister. I whispered to her. She simply looked at me, laughed softly and nodded. Apparently, we weren't the only ones to have that thought. After spotting us in the audience, I saw Diana do a double take at my wife, before continuing with her performance like the professional I could tell she must be. After the show, she came over to us to introduce herself. My dear, you and I are almost dead ringers for each other. She exclaimed to Paula with an accent that instantly gave her away as British. Almost instantly, the two women seemed to connect and develop a friendship with one another. To the point, it ended up with us being invited to dinner with her and her husband, who to my shock turned out to be Richard Dawson of Hogan's Heroes and Family Feud fame. I'd grown up seeing reruns of both shows on TV when I stayed home sick from school. Of course, seeing as neither of those things happened yet, I had to keep my mouth shut and pretend I didn't know who he was. After an amazing dinner, Diana personally extended an invitation for us to attend their shows and the whole of La Parisienne the entire time we were staying at the hotel at a specially reserved table as our guests. And so, we made a ritual for the next 12 days or so out of ending our days watching her sing her heart out. To this day, I can still close my eyes and hear her voice echoing in that room. I likely will for the rest of my life. The two of us had an amazing time. Everything seemed almost too good to be true. Too amazing and fun. Except for something I never told Paula about. Something I know she would have flipped out over. I only really noticed it on the fourth day. I had pushed the terrifying incidents from the parking lot and the elevator out of my mind in an effort to enjoy myself. In fact, I had managed to half convince myself that the elevator incident had in fact been a hallucination and I'd simply lost my cell phone somewhere else. But that illusion was shattered when we stepped off the elevator and waved to Arthur because someone or something stepped out from the shadows behind him. Just long enough for me and me alone to see stepping back and seeming to melt away in the darkness. It was one of the black clad figures from my nightmare dash through what I can only describe as the hellish nightmare version of the hotel, and almost as if to drive home the point that it hadn't been a dream. I saw it raise its hand and wave something at me, something which I immediately recognized and made all the blood drain out of my face. It was my smartphone. Oh fuck me. My mind quietly whispered to itself as the figure vanished back into the black. After that first encounter, I began to realize that the two of us were being followed almost everywhere we went. Whoever they were, were extremely good at not standing out. They always acted so inconspicuous, always blending in with the crowd around them. I only caught on to them when I began to see the same hats and coats filtering through the crowds. 
But they were always careful enough to never let me see their faces. They'd always duck their heads, shielding their features with the white brims of their hats. But they were always there. To say I began to feel paranoid and fearful would be the understatement of the century. I felt like a character in an old Alfred Hitchcock film. A mouse ducked by a cat which didn't want to catch and eat it yet, but wanted its prey to know it was there. I would manage to push it out of my mind when Polly and I began to have fun, but whenever I would catch sight of them, the happy atmosphere would pop like a child's balloon. By next Thursday, my nerves were completely fried, and as much as I enjoyed the fun times we had, all I wanted was to speak to the elevator operator the next day and find a way to get back home. Paula noticed, and when she asked me what was wrong, I did something which I still regret. I lied. I told her it was just the stress of getting back to modern times, not wanting to freak her out by telling her we were being tailed by God only knew who. I will always count that as one of my biggest mistakes. Something done out of some fucking ridiculous sense of wanting to protect her. If I hadn't been so stupid, it might have saved us a lot of the horror still to come. The two of us had just stepped out of the elevator, heading for what might very well be the final show in the dunes we'd ever attend when we heard a voice call out to us. Mr. and Mrs. Clemens? I turned to see Arthur beaming at us and waving us over to him. You two are due to check out soon, I see, he said, looking down into the guest ledger on the counter in front of him. Paula and I exchanged a pensive look at each other before I spoke. Well, we're not exactly sure whether we'll be leaving on Sunday or not, Arthur, I said. Paula spoke up. Yeah, you see, we may end up having more time we're able to spend here, and we may just end up extending our stay another week or so. That is, if we're able to. I silently prayed we wouldn't be told that our room wasn't reserved. If it was, we had another problem to add onto our plate. But Arthur gave us a straight mark smile. Absolutely, you two. We have no other reservations for your room for the next two weeks at least. Just let me know before Saturday night if you'd like to extend your stay. We thanked them, and with that problem solved, hurried to catch Diana and the rest of the performance. Even after seeing it so many times, I'd mentally mapped exactly when and where everything would happen. We still enjoyed ourselves thoroughly. When it ended, Diana came over and told us, not without a slight trace of sadness in her voice, that her and her husband were flying back to Los Angeles the following morning. Apparently, she was going to be appearing on a game show called Stump the Stars in a few months' time. It was a bit of a bittersweet parting to say the least. Paula and her shared a hug goodbye, and so did I a moment later. Don't forget about us, okay? I said to her after stepping back from our embrace. I hadn't intended for the words which I'd whispered in my head to slip out, but they had. I saw Paula shoot me a bit of a concerned look out of the corner of my eye. Diana let out a laugh, but I could see a bit of a curious look enter her eyes. Why, I don't think I could ever forget either of you two, she said. Especially not when you're married to my doppelganger. I laughed back. But for a moment, I internally debated about telling her the truth. About where Paula and I were from, when we were from, and everything in between. But I held my tongue, knowing it could end badly if I did. And so, the two of us bid her a safe flight and watched her leave the auditorium for the last time. Come on, darling, Paula said, taking me by the arm. Let's get back to our room and get some sleep. We have a busy day tomorrow. I nodded, allowing her to lead me back through the lobby to the bank of elevators. Along the way though, I made my head swivel around like an owl's, searching in all directions for any sign of our stalkers. But I saw no one, no men in coats and hats. In a way, it filled me with a bit of relief, but it also made me feel more on edge than ever. Not seeing hide or hair of them made it feel like something was up. I pray to God it's not. I just want to get up to our room and sleep. The elevator lets out its now familiar ding, and the door slid open. To my shock, the man who had been manning the elevator controls the last few days was gone. Instead, the young man who we'd been waiting to return was running the controls. Paula and I shared a surprised look, and then both entered the elevator quickly. 
According to Arthur, the kit shouldn't have been working again until tomorrow. I don't know, maybe he came back a day early to cover someone else's shift or something. I thought to myself, who cares anyways, this is your chance to talk to him. The doors closed and the elevator began its climb up to our floor. I waited for a few seconds before turning to the man. Uh, excuse me? I said. The man turned to look at me, and after a few seconds, his blank look was replaced with one of recognition. Ah, hello you two, he said cheerfully. I see you managed to wrangle yourself up some normal looking clothes, huh? Have you two enjoyed your time here? Both of us nodded. Yes, we did. Thanks for asking, I said. Then pressed on before he could say anything. Look, you said you've seen others like us before, right? People who seem out of place, dressed funny and all that? The man nodded. Yes, sir. Ever since I started working here three or four years ago, every once in a while we'll get, well, pardon my saying so, but odd-looking folks showing up occasionally. Management told me it's happened ever since this place opened up seven years ago. I felt a pang of surprise shoot through me. Ever since seven years ago? 1955? People have accidentally wound up in the past from the present for that long? But why did no one ever say anything about it? Another thought crossed my mind, one which worried me. Maybe they were never able to get back. I pushed that thought away. I needed to keep my head to keep asking the men questions. But Paula jumped in before I could open my mouth again. Well, we just wanted to know, what happened to them? How long did they stay here? Did they check out and drive off like everyone else? The man rubbed his chin as he thought. Honestly, ma'am, I can't answer all those questions. I only work the elevators. Shit. I saw a look of disappointment fall over Paula's features. But then the man continued. However, I do know that many of them stayed only a week or two at most. Fourteen days was the longest I saw any of them stay. I did ask the management a time or two the same question you asked me, and I always was told that they did check out and left. The guys running the valley always told me their odd-looking cars always left the parking lot, so I can only assume that they did drive away. Now, he gave us a bit of a puzzled look. If I may be so bold to ask, why did you want to know? Paula and I quickly exchanged a look. Both of us immediately realized we accidentally walked into a situation we couldn't easily explain away especially with our specific questions. She shrugged at me, as if to say I don't know what to say to that. For a second, I mulled over our options in my head, trying to decide what to do. But then, a single thought swam forward. To hell with it, it's time to come clean. I turned to the man. To be honest, sir, I'm not sure if you'd believe me if we told you the true reason we asked him. I felt my wife grab my forearm hard. The elevator operator raised an eyebrow. Why don't you try me? He said. I've heard all sorts of wild things in my time here. How wilder could what you say be than all of it? Paula talked on my arm harder. Danny? Don't. We don't know what'll happen if we tell someone the truth. I turned to her. Paula, this may be the only way to find out how to get back. I said quietly. As long as we tell one person, I think we'll be okay. She bit her lip apprehensively, but eventually nodded. I returned the gesture, then turned to the man to my right to start talking. And then, the elevator lights went out again, plunging us into almost pitch blackness. Instantly, my heart began to pound furiously in my chest as the memory I tried so desperately hard to push away surged forward. Memories of appearing alone and being chased by the black clad figures. But this time was different. I could still hear Paula breathing, now in a slightly panicked, shallow way. I felt her grab onto my arm, and a slight amount of relief passed to me. Stupid piece of junk. I heard the elevator operator mutter to my right, and then he raised his voice. Just give me a moment, you two. This happens every once in a while. I heard him step away and begin to fumble with something. It's alright, sweetheart. I whispered to Paula as I felt her press against my side. Before she had a chance to reply though, another sound reached us. I couldn't tell what exactly it was, or where in the elevator it came from, 
but it made my already anxiety-ridden mind swirl with nightmarish images. Images of a black clad figure raising an axe to plunge into my skull. Please, God, no, I began mentally whispering. A moment later, my prayer seemed to be answered as the lights came back on and the elevator began to move upwards again. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding in and turned to my wife. See, we're okay, I said, smiling at her. Her blue eyes locked with mine and she returned the smile, but only for a moment. I watched her eyes slide away from me and look somewhere behind me. I saw her face suddenly turn pale and a look of utter terror slide over her features like a mask. She began breathing rapidly and backed up until her back was against the elevator wall. A colossal tidal wave of fear and dread surged through me at her reaction. I was beyond terrified to turn around. The woman was someone who didn't scare easily, a quality of hers I always loved. So to see her like this only meant something horrible was now behind me. But I knew whether or not I wanted to, I had to look. Swallowing hard, I slowly turned around. It only took a split second to notice the two things she had seen. The first was that the elevator operator lay on the floor of the elevator on his back. His arms and legs were splayed out, and for a moment, I feared the worst. But then I saw his chest rise and fall, and realized he was merely unconscious. The realization brought a microsecond of comfort and relief to me, but it was shattered by the second detail, which made me rapidly back up to stand just in front of my wife, arms protectively held out as if to shield her. We were no longer alone in the elevator. A massive figure in a black coat and hat, one which had been tipped down to hide the wearer's face, stood almost exactly where I had last seen the operator. Whoever it was had to be at least six four or taller. It was perfectly still and unmoving as the elevator continued towards our floor. To make matters worse, I couldn't hear the figure breathing, which sent another lightning bolt of fear coursing through me. I shot the floor indicator over the doors a quick sidelong glance, seeing we were only three floors away from ours. And then, as the last floor passed, it spoke. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Clemens. It was clearly a man, one who spoke with a deep, gravely voice, as though he'd smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day for years. My heart practically stopped. Our names, they know our fucking names. What the fuck? I heard Paula breathe out behind me. Her words apparently amused the man, because he began to let out a chuckle, one which sounded like nails on a chalkboard. Yes. What the fuck indeed, he muttered, raising his hat just enough for us to see he wore a truly wicked smile, but not enough to see his eyes. I felt the elevator come to a stop as it reached our floor. I remained where I was, but I slowly reached my hand behind me for Paula's. We only have one shot to get out of this elevator alive. Thankfully, I failed to grab it a moment later. What the fuck do you people want? I finally demanded. For a few seconds, there was silence, until I heard the elevator ding, and then the figure spoke, all trace of humor gone from his voice. I think you know Mr. Clemens, he said. Oh shit. Before I had another moment to think, the figure suddenly turned and lunged for us, letting out a cry. It was the same voice I'd heard from the black clad figure last week. But I had already anticipated the man's lunch and had been lying in wait. The second he exploded into motion, so did I. The biggest saving grace for us was that the elevator doors had begun to open as the man had spoken and provided us with an avenue to escape. I pulled hard on Paula's arm, practically shoving her out of the elevator ahead of me in the hall. The man tried to course correct as we dodged his attack, but it was far too tall to do so at the very last moment. He crashed headfirst into the wall of the elevator with a rather sickening crunch of wood paneling and fell to the floor, his hat tumbling off his head and revealing his identity to us. I heard Paula let out a gasp as she stumbled to her feet. The fucking bellhop? She almost screamed. The man who turned to look up at us with a mixture of frustration and hatred was the same bellhop who pulled our luggage from the trunk of my car the night we arrived. 
You gotta be fucking kidding. But I had no time to think anything more beyond that. The man had begun to scramble to his feet. I dashed forward again, reaching around the inside corner of the elevator with a frantically searching hand. The raised, round edges of the floor buttons met my fingers, and I slammed my palm down, hitting as many of them as I could. The elevator let out another ding, and I leapt backwards as the doors rapidly closed. The man leapt for us, but a second too late, we heard him slam into the closed doors and scream out in frustration. It was the same sound he made when I touched him in the black, empty version of the hotel. The thought suddenly made me roll around. I feared I'd suddenly see nothing but darkness around us, that we had been sent to that hellish alternate version when the lights in the elevators had gone out. To my relief, however, I saw only the same regular hallway we'd become well accustomed to for the last eleven days. As I stared, I saw a door open down the hallway and a sleepy annoyed man poke his head out of the room. I'll call security if you keep that- I'll call security if you keep that damn racket up, he said, and then slammed the door shut. Paul and I exchanged a look and then dashed for our room. Jamming the key into the lock, I practically wrenched the door open and then slammed it shut behind us and locked it. Finally, I grabbed one of the sturdy chairs from the sitting area and wedged it underneath the doorknob. I knew it wouldn't keep anyone out for long, especially if they really wanted to get in here, but at least it would give us a warning. I turned around to find Paula staring at me. You recognize this voice, she whispered simply. I saw the look on your face. You recognized it. For a moment, I was unsure about what to say, but I knew I couldn't hide anything from her anymore. Not where things had now progressed to her being in danger. I should have told her from the start. So, I brought her over to the couch and sat her down, and proceeded to tell her everything. From exactly what had happened in the parking lot the first night we'd arrived, to the nightmare hotel I'd experienced the second day, and about the figures which had followed us the entire time we'd been out and about. I saw a mixture of fear and anger cross her face as I told her. I knew she was upset at me for not telling her sooner, but happily, she held back on giving me a tongue lashing. So, what do we do now? She asked after I finished, her voice shaking slightly. I shook my head. I can only think of one thing to do. She looked at me, called down to reception, have them call the cops, and tell them, well, not tell where we're from, but that we've been followed and attacked in a way they'll believe. We can't deal with this on our own anymore. She began to play furiously with her hair and stayed silent for a few seconds then slowly nodded. You're right, we can't deal with this alone. She locked eyes with me. But while we wait for them to arrive, you and I are going to have a serious talk about hiding things from each other from now on. I sighed and nodded. I fully deserved what was about to come my way. All right, let me call downstairs, I said. Crossing to the bed, I sat on the edge and picked up the handset from the phone's cradle punching in the single number for the front desk. I heard it begin ringing. After the third ring, the line was picked up. Hello? Instantly, I felt a wave of relief flash to me. It was Arthur. I never thought I'd be so happy to hear another man's voice. Arthur? This is Danny Clemens in room 614. I said quickly. Ah, Mr. Clemens. I hope you and your wife enjoyed Miss Dorsey's last show. He said jovially. Yes, we did. Thank you very much, I said. But I need to urgently speak to you. The jovialness seemed to deflate out of Arthur's voice immediately. Why, whatever is the matter, young man? He asked, his voice filled with concern. We were just attacked in the elevator up to our room by one of your bellhops, the one who brought our luggage inside the night we arrived. I heard the man let out a surprised breath on his end of the line. My, my. Dead serious, Mr. Clemens, he said. Yeah, you're not joking. Listen, Arthur, I hate to do this, but I need you to call the police. Have them come to our room right away, please. A sudden dizzy spell struck me, and I put my free hand to my forehead to try and study myself. I must be panicking too much. Gotta stay calm. But Arthur's next voice almost seemed to intensify my dizzy spell. I don't think we need to involve the police in such matters, Daniel. I felt a wave of confusion and shock wash over me. Uh, 
Excuse me? I stammered out. Arthur's voice spoke again, seemingly more authoritative than I'd ever heard it before. I said, I don't think we need to involve the police in such matters, Daniel. Not when we can solve them ourselves. I stood up from the bed, feeling my legs almost give out from under me, and the room seemed to spin around me. The hell are you talking about, Arthur? I said weakly. Exactly what I said twice, Daniel. He said, and then laughed softly before continuing. I thought you folks from the 21st century were supposed to be so much smarter than us. The biggest surge of terror flooded through my veins at his words, seemingly quicker than everything else. He knows? I think what you two need is a good night's sleep. We've already sent something up to help you do so. Compliments of the management. As his words reached my increasingly sluggish mind, I suddenly became aware of two things. The first was that Paula had collapsed onto the bed face first. For a moment, I feared she was dead. Then I realized she was unconscious. The second was that I heard the soft hissing voice of something entering the room through the ventilation duct over the bed. Gas. Sleeping gas or something. Fuck. Still holding the receiver, I began moving towards the sliding door to the balcony, one which now seemed miles away. I need to open it. My legs gave out from under me, and I dropped to my knees on the carpet. Behind me, I heard the clattering sound of the phone's cradle toppling off the desk, and I fell onto my side on the floor. Darkness began to envelop the edges of my vision and rapidly move inwards. When you and your lovely wife wake up, you'll understand everything. Arthur's voice, now filled with an almost sadistic tone, filtered into my ears from what sounded like miles away, and he let out another laugh. It would become one I would hear often in my nightmares after we made it back. Even months later, blackness overcame me, and as I slipped away, I heard him say two final words in a mocking sing-song manner. Sweet dreams. Coming to after abruptly falling into unconsciousness is never a pleasant experience. I'm not sure which it was that began to pull me from the blackness which had cocooned me inside of it. The feeling of nausea and dizziness, or the faint sound of voices emanating from somewhere a ways away from me. All I know is, I slowly became aware that I was awake again. For a few moments, my mind was muddled. Thoughts coming to me slowly, as if they were slugging through waist-high mud. I tried as hard as I could to recall what had happened before I fell asleep. Did I drink too much again and pass out in the hotel room chair? And then, like a semi-truck smashing into me at 70 miles an hour, everything came flooding back, snapping me fully awake. I remembered where, and more precisely, when we were. I remembered the events of the two weeks. I remember being attacked in the elevator by the bellhop would appeared out of nowhere. Remembered Paul and I rushing to what we thought was the safety of our hotel room. And I remembered the phone call I'd made, the sinister, sadistic voice of Arthur mocking me on the other end, before the room had filled with some sort of gas and causing us to fall unconscious. As my vision returned to me, I also became aware that I was no longer in the hotel room. The dark, drab gray concrete wall standing opposite me combined with the faint sound of water dripping somewhere gave me the idea that I was on the ground somewhere, maybe a basement or something. I also became aware that I couldn't move anything except for my head. Glancing down, I saw I was tied with rather thick rope to some kind of metal chair, one which had its back to another. Paula! I twisted my neck around as far as it could go, my eyes locking to my wife's unmistakable blonde hair. Like me, she too was tied to the chair she had been sat in, her head slumped forward, showing me that she was still unconscious. Well, at least thank god she's not dead, I thought. The thought brought me a momentary feeling of relief, which was then shattered by the voice which spoke up, coming from somewhere off to my left. Ah, good. You're finally awake, Daniel. I spun my head the other way and was immediately blinded by the bright light which snapped on. I jammed my eyes shut, wincing at the sudden ache in my temples. Henry, you idiot. You blinded our poor guest here. The voice snapped. Lower the brightness a bit, will you? The light became less intense. 
and after opening my eyes and blinking away the blue spots in my vision, I saw them. There had to be at least five or six figures standing just behind the light, one which looked to be an old-style construction spotlight. I also saw something which sent a lightning bolt of horror through me. The floor had what looked like dried blood stains on it. Oh shit. Behind me, I heard a groan, indicating that Paula was beginning to wake up. And it seems your wife is coming around as well. What truly exciting timing indeed. Something inside my mind clicked, and I realized that I recognized the voice. Arthur. I said simply, not phrasing it as a question, but more a statement. The sound of clapping came from behind the light, and one figure stepped in front of it. As my eyes adjusted, I saw he was still wearing his hotel uniform. Though the warm friendly smile I'd become well acquainted with was long gone. In its place, he wore a smile which gave a literal meaning to the phrase, skin crawling. Very good Daniel, he said, before turning towards my wife, who was now struggling in an attempt to free herself. And welcome back to the land of the living to you as well, Mrs. Clemens. Instantly, I felt her go still behind me. Where are we? I heard her ask, her voice shaking slightly. Arthur let loose another eerie smile. We're in the basement of the dunes, my dear. He answered, looking back at me and flashing a truly wicked smile. And for the record, don't get the idea to try and scream for help. This section of the basement is soundproof so nobody in the rest of the basement will hear you. What the fuck do you want with us? I demanded, glaring at the man. And more to the point, how the hell did you know we're from the future? I heard Paula let out a gasp behind me. Since she'd passed out, I never had gotten a chance to tell her what had been said to me over the phone. Arthur let out a low chuckle, then gestured behind him at the shadowy figures behind the light. I suppose I should explain that, shouldn't I? He said, as another figure brought him a chair to sit in. As the figure turned away, I saw the sneering face of the bellhop who had attacked us. Arthur took a few steps forward, before placing the chair down and taking a seat in it. After a moment of getting comfortable, he began to speak. I've worked at this hotel and casino the entire time it's been here. I was personally asked to help run the day-to-day -day business on the hotel side by my boss and his group. And not long after we fully opened seven years ago, we began to notice, well, shall we say, odd individuals show up from time to time. At first, we didn't know what to make of them, assuming we were simply being visited by peculiar men and women who had their own way to dress and speak. He stood up and began to pace around us, circling us in almost the same manner a shark would circle a wounded fish or seal. That was until one of the casino pit bosses caught one of them attempting to count cards at blackjack. Much like you two, we brought him down here, to a place we wouldn't be disturbed. He wouldn't speak at first, as all of them tend to do. But, well, he let out a truly sinister snicker, which made me shudder. Everyone has their limit of pain where they break. And that, that is when we learn the truth. He said he was a time traveler, Someone from far in the future would come back to visit here. He even told us where his machine was, up in his room. Of course, we didn't believe him at the time. And when I phoned Mr. Patriarca to ask about what we should do with him, well, he drew his thumb across his throat, mimicking someone's throat being cut. We got rid of him. Patriarca, I mumbled, my brain wearing into gear as old memories from growing up in the East Coast began flying to my brain and connected with the name. I'm sorry, did you say something? Arthur asked, stopping his inferno circling and leaning towards me. I looked up at him, locking eyes with him. Raymond Patriarca, I said slowly, then chuckled and shook my head. The Patriarca crime family? A genuinely surprised look came over Arthur's face. You know about Mr. Patriarca and the family? He asked. I nodded. I grew up on the East Coast. His name is still infamous in those parts, even decades after his death, and I was always a bit of a history buff. A smile, not a mocking one, 
but almost the same genuine smile I'd seen when first arriving spread across his face, and he reached out and patted me on the shoulder a few times. Well, for the first time ever, I'm surprised by something someone from the 21st century said to me. He said happily, I was wrong about my initial impressions of you, Daniel. Please accept my apologies for my insult earlier. It's truly an honor to know the family ends up being burned into history, and that Mr. Patriarcha does as well. He sighed and stood back up. That makes it doubly a shame about what's going to happen to you. Anyway, back to what I was saying. He said, beginning to circle us again. After we dealt with him, I was personally tasked with going up and getting rid of the man's luggage. I was in the middle of doing so when something small and silver fell out of his suitcase. I remember picking it up out of sheer curiosity. Stepping out of the room, for the hell of it, I slipped it into my pocket and disposed of the rest of his belongings, keeping his cash to send back to the boss. I went out for a smoke after everything wound down, stepping out front and started messing with it. All of a sudden, a bright white light flashed all around me, and when it disappeared, I was still outside. But the dunes? It was gone. I was still standing in front of a building, but it was one I'd never seen before. It had the name. He trailed off for a moment scrunching up his face as he remembered. Bellagio. He stopped circling again, sitting back down in the chair and looking back and forth at me and my wife. I saw strange, futuristic-looking cars driving along the strip. Everything looked different. That was when I looked up at the sign out front, with the same name as on the building, and saw the date on the sign. 2027. And then I knew the man had been telling us the truth. He leaned back in the chair, laughing, almost at the mental absurdity of it all. After that, I frantically began hitting the buttons on the silver device again. And thankfully, the white light appeared again, and I was back in front of the dunes. I was going to make a call to Mr. Patriarcha to tell him about the truth, when something stopped me. Something inside me told me to keep it to myself. Because now, I was the one with all the power, more power than any amount of money my boss could ever have and I say that with all due respect to him. So, I decided to wait a while. That was when more of the strange looking and speaking people began to show up. Some I could tell were like the men we took care of, time travelers, something straight out of an H.G. Wells novel. Others looked to be also from the future, but just not as futuristic seeming as the others. And that's when I learned something, and I actually learned it from another of the time travelers we captured. A woman, the last one we captured, actually. You see, when people from the future travel back to any point in time, they apparently can accidentally create something which the woman called a time slip. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but apparently, it can accidentally suck people from any point in time back to when the person using their device goes. And that is when I had the great idea. You see, the rest of the outfit here. He gestured to the figures behind the light, who all waved at us and laughed. We like to have a little fun with people. Always have. It's just a sort of appetite. He let loose the most sadistic evil grin I'd ever seen him give. And I shuddered, knowing full well what he meant by that. But we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. We don't want to ruin the operation the boss has a stake in out here. And if too many people from here now begin to disappear, it'll draw too much heat on us. Likewise, if we make too many of the people who seem to deliberately time travel here disappear, It'll also ruin things. So, we developed the system. You see, the device seems to be connected to others, as it'll give a warning when someone travels here. That's when we keep our eyes peeled. Because, more times than not, it'll accidentally catch someone from a different time, be it the early 21st century or farther along. And they'll wind up here, confused and searching for a place to stay, just like you two did. He stood up again, now giving us both a shark-like grin and that allows us two things. It gives us a chance to get money and futuristic technology to hold on to. And secondly, the shark-like grin widened. Well, unfortunately for you two, you're about to learn how we like to keep ourselves sharp when it comes to, well, let's just say, the techniques you probably have heard about us having. And no one will ever know, because here, in 1962, you don't exist yet. And in your time, 
You will just simply have vanished. Like all the others before you have. His speech finally finished. He stood as tall as he could, grinning at us and waiting for our reactions. There was a long stretch of silence. What about that dark, abandoned version of the hotel I found myself in? I finally asked. He shrugged. A little bit of future technology we swiped from the woman. He said simply. And the cameras? I asked. The ones I saw recording me as I ran. He chuckled. Well, we like to replay our interactions with our favorite guests for entertainment. It started with that little scare you had in the parking lot that first night. He pointed at one man. Henry had fun with you that night. And if a discerning buyer on the black market wants a film of that style, we're happy to oblige. You're all fucking evil. Paula spat out behind me. You're all sadistic bastards. Almost as one, Arthur and the others began to laugh. My dear, you do flatter us, Arthur said, wiping away tears from his eyes. I felt my temper flame. Fucking simpletons. I hissed under my breath. Almost at once, everyone went silent. Arthur took a few steps until he stood in front of me. Excuse me? He asked, his voice flat and emotionless. You fucking hurt me, dumbass. I crawled at him. You think you really scare me just because you're part of the Mafia? I grew up around people far worse than you. Perks of having a single father who was a prison guard, who had to take his son along with him to work. I shifted my gaze between him and the shadowy forms of the others. You insinuated that I was dumb on the phone. Clearly, you and your people are not the cream of the crop when it comes to 20th century intelligence. All you are is a bunch of muscle-bound Neanderthals who accidentally stumbled across something you could never have the brains to create in a million years. No fucking wonder the mob ended up dying out. It was my turn to grin. I knew full well that the situation we were in was one we likely weren't getting out of. I'd attempted to loosen the knots in the rope during the man's speech, but they were done far too well and tight to wiggle out of. My mind flooded back to the tortures I remembered hearing the mob performing and every fiber of my being trembled with fear at the knowledge that we were about to endure them ourselves. But if both of us were going to die, I was going to use my tongue to give them some mental and emotional barbs to remember us by, long after we were gone. And for the record, your oh-so-revered boss is now relentlessly mocked in my time for dying a frail old man of a heart attack. What a gigantic fall from grace. I now gave my own version of Arthur's shark-like grin. Time passing by is a bitch, ain't it? Instantly, I knew I'd had a nerve. The emotionless mask Arthur had put on his face melted away, replaced by one of absolute rage. Then, it melted away, replaced with the evil grin he'd won all the while. Well, Daniel, I had originally been thinking about making it rather quick for you after you'd impressed me, you and your lovely wife. But, after that insult... I think we're going to take our time with you. His face went emotionless again. Both of you. I felt the blood drain from my face. While I was certain we were both going to die, I'd hoped, in addition to stinging the man with the truth about the leader of his crime family, that whatever torturous death they had in store for us, I'd take most of it off my wife and project it onto me. But in hindsight, it was almost a certainty that others had attempted to bait him. The man wasn't an idiot. Arthur pointed at the group of men behind the light. Everyone follow me to the storage closet. I have a particularly fun demise for these two. We'll all be able to take part in. He said, then pointed at the shape of one man. Except you. You stay and watch them. We'll be back in less than ten minutes. And with that, he stepped back behind the light and walked away. His goons following after him. After a minute or so, I heard Paula let out a sigh behind me. You have any sort of plan, Danny? She asked softly. I snorted. I wish I did. I admit it. I'm trying to think of anything, but nothing's coming to me. She sighed again, and then felt the tips of her fingers brush mine. Danny, if this is the last bit of time we're going to share on this earth, I just want you to know, I love you so damn much. However this ends... Meeting you was the best thing to ever happen to me. So, thank you 
for everything. Tears formed in my eyes at her words. I love you too, sweetheart. I managed out. I was about to say more when I suddenly became aware of the sound of rapidly approaching footsteps. The lone remaining figure behind the light turned as someone else entered the room and spoke. Hey Mikey, Arthur sent for me to get you. Apparently he lost his set of keys and you're the only one with access to the backup set. He wants you to go get them and bring them to him at the storage room. The other man cursed and then hooked the thumb at us. Do me a favor and watch these two then, okay? Can do, the newcomer said, and the first man rushed out of the room. The sound of the man's departing footsteps disappeared. For a few more seconds, there was silence, and then the new man stepped into the light. My eyes widened slightly as I recognized the young man who had operated the elevators for us the entire time we stayed in the dunes. He stood for a minute, staring at us, and then looked behind him at the open door, seemingly satisfied with something. He pulled something out from his pocket. I shrank back a bit when I saw the metal blade of a folding knife appear, but then he rushed to us and knelt down. I felt an odd sensation and suddenly realized what he was doing. He saw me through the ropes. The man looked at me. Look, I don't have time to explain right now, but I honestly can't stand the things Arthur does to people anymore, so I'm going to try and help you both get out of here. A corner of his mouth pulled up in a half smile. Plus, I kind of got paid a lot of money by someone to make sure you stay okay. My mind raced as I felt the ropes loosen and fall away from my wrists. A moment later, the one spining my ankles in the chair gave way and stood up, trying to get some feelings into my legs. The man freed Paula a few moments later, and she stood up, rushing to me and embracing me with an almost ribcage crushing hug and kiss. But there wasn't much time to do more. Hurry, follow me, the man said, and then moved to the open doorway. The two of us quickly followed him. He stared out into the gloomy hallway and then motioned for us to follow him. My heart beat hard in my chest as I stepped out into the stone hall after him. I felt Paula's hand on my shoulder as she followed close behind. We stayed as silent as we could, moving from one drab hallway to the next. As we drew close to a T-junction, I heard the sound of a group of men's voices approaching, laughing and talking excitedly. In here, the man said opening the door to what looked like a small office. We all flew inside. The man closed the door, leaving only a hair crack open. The voices grew louder and I recognized Arthur's voice speaking over all the rest of them. Now, now, gentlemen, don't argue about who gets to go first. Remember, we're all going to have a turn with these on both of them, and you'll each get to take a souvenir to remember our fun by. Another man spoke up. I called dibs on the man's wedding ring. That thing looks nice. A third man spoke up. Then I called tips on the woman's ring. It'll be something I love to give my wife for an anniversary present. I shuddered a bit in the dark. They're not only fighting for who gets to torture us first, but fighting with each other over who gets to strip things from our bodies, like they're a flock of vultures. Despite all the terrifying and horrible things we've been through so far, hearing that was perhaps one of the most soul-destroying and horrifying The voices again grew distant as they moved down the hallway. We have to hurry. They realize you're gone in about three or four minutes. Our rescuer whispered, then opened the door again and led the way back out into the hall. The hallways changed from stone-sided and cold back to the industrial style that places such as hotels and restaurants were known for. The men now walked upright, striding quickly along as he guided us past an industrial laundry room and group of women folding sheets and towels. As we turned another corner, I almost let out a massive sigh of relief as I saw the metal doors of an elevator at the end of the hall. The man turned to us as he reached the doors and slapped the button to call it. Okay now look, I've taken all your things from your room and put them in your car outside. I was supposed to get rid of both of them, so they didn't care what I was doing. He held his hand out, and I saw he was holding the keys to my BMW in them. I took them and held them in my own hand, and then looked back up at him. They'll kill you for doing this, you know, I said. He let out a small chuckle as the elevator dinged, announcing its arrival. They would have tried killing me anyways, since I called and let Mr. Patriarch know personally what his supposed loyal men were withholding from him. 
He's already sent a lot of muscle to deal with Arthur and the others. Besides, he looked down at his feet. I don't think I could live with myself if I let another innocent person die at their hands. Paula reached out and put a hand on the man's shoulder. Thank you, she said simply, and the man nodded. He was about to say something else when the sound of thundering footsteps came from the way we'd come. Hurry, into the elevator, the man said urgently and pushed us inside. He stepped inside himself and slammed the button for the lobby. Just as the doors began to close, I saw the red, furious face of Arthur come around the corner. He held a pistol in his hands and aimed it at the elevator. Jimmy, you fucking traitor! He yelled and squeezed off two or three shots, but the door had already shut. I heard the sound of the bullets slamming into the other side of them. The elevator rose quickly. As I fought to catch my breath, I turned to the man, Jimmy. By the way, very quickly, who paid you to watch out for us? I asked. The man chuckled. Let's just say she loved having you and your wife at her performances and got concerned when you told her not to forget you. The realization flashed through my mind, and I let out a soft chuckle. God bless you, Diana. I saw the same realization cross my wife's face, and a similar smile crossed her face. But then, they faded as the doors opened, presenting us in the empty elevator lobby. Come on, they'll be up here in a moment, Jimmy said, running for the main lobby. We followed close behind. As we ran, we passed a few guests who gave us puzzled looks. The main lobby, its check-in desk now vacant with a gold sign stating, we've temporarily stepped out, be back shortly, standing off to the side. As we ran into the entrance hallway, I heard the sound of a door slamming open, followed by men shouting, Shit, here they come. Jimmy slammed his shoulder into the entrance doors, allowing Paula and I to rush out onto the entrance steps. Just as he said, the BMW sat in almost the exact same place it had when we arrived, what seemed like a lifetime ago. Just drive back out the way you came, Jimmy yelled at us. If I've worked it right, you'll make it back to wherever you came from. Paula turned to look at him. Come with us, she urged. But Jimmy shook his head. Where you're from isn't a place for me. Besides, I have to hold them off long enough for you to escape. He shot a look over his shoulder as the yelling voices drew nearer, and then back at us. Now go! He screamed the final two words at us before shutting the entrance door. I saw him reach up and lock them. Come on! I shouted at Paula, and then ran for my car, sliding across the hood like some action movie hero, but feeling more like a character in a horror movie. I yanked open the driver's door and crashed into the seat. I saw my wife do the same. As I jammed the key into the ignition and twisted, I shot one final look through the glass doors. Arthur and his men had already reached them. I saw many of them grabbing onto Jimmy, while others struggled to unlock the doors. Drive, Danny! Paula shouted at me, and I yanked the gear shift down into drive, stomping my foot onto the accelerator. The rear tire squealed, and the car shot out from under the entrance awning. In the rear view mirror, I saw the men finally stumble outside. And then... We were skidding out onto the main road. I kept my foot hard down as the bright lights of the casinos flashed by us on all sides in a neon blur. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Paula suddenly twist around in her seat. Oh shit, they're coming after us! Shooting a look in the rearview mirror, I saw a pair of headlights rapidly approaching behind. Damn it! I hissed, looking down at the speedometer. We were doing at least 90 miles an hour. Something suddenly rang out. A sound I couldn't place at first. And then it came again, and I realized what it was. They're shooting at us, I yelled. Just keep going, Paula shouted back. In the distance ahead, I saw the neon sign welcoming us to Vegas. I've just gotta make it there. I kept repeating it as the pursuing car drew closer and closer. The sign rapidly approached us. In the rearview mirror, I saw the mask of animalistic rage and blood lost on Arthur's face as he sat in the passenger seat of the car behind us. A moment later, I felt the impact as it slammed into us. The rear of the BMW broke loose for a moment, sliding to one side slightly, and I fought to regain control. God, please do not let us die like this, I screamed inside my mind. I felt us get bumped from behind again, 
and a new wave of horror shot through me at the prospect. This could all be over in a matter of seconds. That's when a bright white light suddenly flashed in front of us. Jesus Crow! I shouted, jamming my eyes shut against the blinding flash. For a few seconds, I could see the bright light behind my closed eyelids. And then, it slowly faded. After a moment, I opened my eyes again. Blinking rapidly, I looked in the rearview mirror, expecting Arthur and his gang to still be hot on our heels. But nobody was behind us. Nobody was in front of us either. All I saw was the black tarmac stretching out and away from us. What happened? I heard Paula say quietly in the passenger seat. I... I don't know. I managed out. Easing off the gas, I slowly brought the car over to the breakdown lane until it came to a stop. Keeping my foot on the brake and the car in drive, I leaned back in the seat. I looked at her. I don't know what happened. I stopped, then looked at her again. Wait, remember? Remember what Arthur said? When a bright flash of light happened, he suddenly found himself in the 21st century. Her jaw dropped open as my words registered. Does... does that mean we're back? I shook my head. I didn't know. For all I know, it's a freaking trick to get us to stop. Almost as if my thoughts had summoned it. A bright pair of headlights suddenly shot through the back window. My eyes flashed to the rearview mirror, and I saw a car rapidly approaching us. Shit! I cried out, stumping back on the gas. The car shot forward, but not quickly enough. The other car was going too fast to outrun. And for a horrible moment, I prepared myself to be riddled with bullets. But then, the car flashed by us. I blinked to make sense of what I was seeing. It wasn't a car from the 50s or 60s. It was a 